Today, I'm gonna to be pitching the brand new Sigma 105 mm f2.8 DG DN macro lens against its closest rivals, the Sony 90 mm f2.8 macro and the Tokina Firin 100 mm f2.8 FE macro lens. And hopefully, at the end of this video, we'll determine which is the best out of these autofocus macro lenses for full frame mirrorless cameras. As always, this is a totally independent test. None of the lens manufacturers have paid me to make this test, so you can rest assured that the views expressed in this video are purely my own and entirely based off the evidence that I've collected over the week or so of having these lenses. I can guarantee you I've not received any cheeky backhanders from Tokina, Sony or Sigma on this one, unfortunately. I should also mention that I am fully aware that there are a few other macro options available for full frame mirrorless cameras. However, not all of them have autofocus. Some of them are manual focus only. So it wouldn't really be a fair test in my opinion to pitch them against the likes of the brand new Sigma and the Sony and the Tokina, which all have AF. Also focal length has to be taken into consideration as well. Although all three of these lenses are slightly different in terms of focal lengths, they're close enough to one another where it shouldn't really make too much of a noticeable difference on the final aesthetics of the images that they create. Okay, enough of that. Let's get stuck into the specs of each of these lenses, starting with the cheapest option first and working our way up to the most expensive. First up is the Tokina Firin 100mm f2.8 FE macro lens. Currently priced at £415 or $599, this lens is predominantly plastic in build and is also the lightest lens in the group weighing just 570 grams or just over 20 ounces. The lens design is minimalist to say the least, <laughs> apart from a rubberized focus ring there are no features on the lens at all and I mean nothing. So this is something to bear in mind if you prefer a lens with manual switches and dials. Next up is the brand new Sigma 105mm f2.8 DG DN macro lens. If you happen to be a connoisseur of Sigma's range of lenses, like myself, no. You may be aware that there is already a Sigma 105mm f2.8 macro available on the market, but that was only ever made for DSLRs and there isn't an option available for Sony E-mount or any other mirrorless cameras. So this is a brand new lens that's been designed from scratch specifically for mirrorless cameras. At launch, this will be priced at £699 or $799. So it's almost double the price of the Tokina and is slightly heavier at 715 grams, which equates to just over 25 ounces. This additional weight is largely down to its construction being made up of a mixture of metal and hard plastics. On the lens body, there is a manual aperture dial which clicks at every third of a stop, or you can use the de-click button on the underside of the lens to allow for a smooth transition through the apertures. This feature might be useful for videographers who like to adjust the exposure of their footage whilst they're filming using the aperture dial. However, if you prefer to change the aperture using the back of the camera, you can do so by setting the aperture ring to A for automatic and then fix it in place using the lock switch to avoid accidentally knocking it over to F22, for example. Working our way further around the lens, there's an MF to AF switch and also an AF lock button that can be customized to function as a shortcut to a multitude of different features. Finally, there's a focus limiter switch which will allow you to restrict the focusing range to prevent it racking all the way through the focal range should it miss focus. One other thing I should mention is that Sigma is the only lens in our lineup to offer any kind of weather sealing. Now they don't name it as weather sealing, it's technically called splash and dust proofing, but essentially it's just a thin rubber gasket around the metal lens mount to help prevent dust and moisture getting inside your camera. Last but not least, we have the Sony 90mm f2.8 Macro GOSS. This is the most expensive lens in our group, priced at £849 or $1,099. In terms of weight, it's a shade heavier than the lightweight Tokina lens, coming in at 602 grams or 21.3 ounces to be precise. The build is predominantly hard plastic, but the focus ring appears to be made from a textured metal rather than the rubberized material that you'd typically expect. Rather than a traditional switch, in order to change from autofocus to manual focus, you have to pull the focus ring backwards towards the camera which is pretty cool actually, and I found this a lot more intuitive to use than a switch. The OSS part of this lens's title stands for Optical Steady Shot, which means that this lens comes with built-in optical stabilization, which can be turned on and off using a switch on the side of the lens. Now, if you're able to pair this feature with in-camera stabilization that's found in most Sony mirrorless cameras, like my Sony A7 Mark III, it'll allow you to capture super steady shots, even if you're shooting handheld, which is awesome. 
Just like the Sigma, there's a focus limiter switch with three different limits and also a customizable button. So now that we know what we're dealing with, let's take a look at image quality. For this test, we took a photo of a lens test chart with each of our lenses stopped wide open to f2.8 to check for things like sharpness, vignetting, and also any signs of lens distortion and fringing. Starting with the Tokina, and there aren't any noticeable signs of distortion, which is a good start. There is a touch of vignetting in the corners, but nothing major that you'd notice in real life situations. If we zoom in, sharpness at the center of the frame isn't bad, but there is a significant amount of purple fringing going on here, which isn't great. Moving over to the corners, and the sharpness starts to drop off, and fringing issues get slightly worse, with signs of green fringing now appearing. Overall, not a shocking performance, but the level of fringing is definitely something that I would personally be concerned about. Okay, so let's move over to the Sigma lens now. There's a touch of what looks like pin cushion distortion at the edges of the frame, but nothing you'd really notice. There is a touch of vignetting at the corners, but again, nothing major. Spoiler alert, the Sigma offers the best center sharpness of all of our lenses. This thing is super sharp, and there aren't any noticeable traces of fringing either, which is really good. Edge sharpness is also very impressive. Although there is a slight drop off in sharpness, it's still the best performing lens of the group by some margin. There is a hint of green and blue fringing starting to create in here but that's all there is really to complain about so overall a very very solid performance from this lens finally there's the sony this lens has some signs of barrel distortion but again nothing significant in terms of vignetting the edges are slightly darker but again nothing to worry about center sharpness is also really good not quite the level of sharpness seen on the sigma but still a very very good performance and there are no signs of fringing either which is a bonus in the corners of the frame, sharpness drops off fairly significantly, which is a shame, and there are some signs of fringing too, but overall a solid performance from the Sony. Heading over to our bokeh balls test images, the Tekina offers soft bokeh balls but with a distinct cat's eye shape. These bokeh balls also appear to flatten out slightly towards the edges of the frame. It's a very similar result from the Sigma lens too, offering cat's eye shaped orbs in the center which seem to flatten out towards the edges of the image. The Sony lens is a slightly different story. The bokeh balls are not so much bokeh balls but bokeh octagons? These octagons then turn into discs as they flatten out towards the edge of the frame. And this is definitely something to bear in mind if this kind of thing bugs you. In terms of bokeh quality, all three lenses produced fairly smooth looking defocused areas. With a maximum aperture of f2.8, you're never going to achieve a full length portrait with a super, super thick blur in the background. But the results are still pleasing enough to be able to capture some really nice portraits. When taking photos close up using the macro feature, all three lenses put in a very good performance and displayed no real issues while shooting. Moving away from image quality, let's talk about AF performance, starting with the Tokina. This lens is definitely the slowest to focus of the three, but it's really not unbearably slow. Despite its slow pace, when shooting in good lighting conditions, it managed to lock onto the target with no signs of hunting at all. In low light, it started to struggle a bit more, but even though it would take a little bit longer to lock onto a target, it never really struggled to a point where it would rack helplessly through the focus range, making it a totally usable lens. The Sigma also worked well and was noticeably quicker to focus than the Tokina when shooting in good lighting conditions. However, when shooting in low light, the AF was definitely slower to lock on and occasionally it would just hunt wildly through the entire focus range. So this is definitely where the focus limiter switch on the side of the lens really comes into its own and it, it helped to prevent the lens from just going wild if it accidentally missed focus. Unsurprisingly, the Sony also worked well in good lighting conditions and proved to be quick and accurate to focus. In low light conditions though, the Sony offers the best AF performance of the three by a significant margin. It was still very quick and showed absolutely no signs of hunting, so another solid performance from Sony. Switching over to video mode and all three lenses managed to keep track of a moving subject walking towards the camera with no problems at all. They even performed well when the subject was moving at a fast pace, so a really good performance across the board for all of these lenses. In terms of AF motor noise, the Sony was by far the quietest, it barely made a noise at all. The Sigma was next, it kind of made a bit of a noise, but nothing that you would really notice. However, with the Tekina, it for some reason sounds like you're beating a squirrel to death. So this might be something just to watch out for if you're planning on using this lens for video. So with the testing complete, I need to pick a winner. So let's start with third place, which is probably the easiest thing to pick. You've probably guessed it by now. That third place goes to the Tekina. 
Although it's a total bargain in terms of price, for me, image quality just isn't there. There's just too much fringing and it just isn't anywhere near as sharp as the other two options. Although the AF was accurate, it was also quite slow and noisy and put simply, it just doesn't compare to either the Sigma or the Sony. Okay, so naming first place isn't gonna be quite as straightforward. The Sigma and the Sony are very, very closely matched. So let's round up both lenses and see where we land. The Sigma is 150 pounds cheaper than the Sony. It has weather sealing and the image quality is undoubtedly the best within our test. Although the AF is fast, it did on occasion hunt. And if you don't have the focus limiter set correctly, then this could get slightly annoying as it racks all the way through the focus range. Hopefully that would be updated in a firmware update, but fingers crossed for that. The Sony, on the other hand, has optical stabilization. It has that nice AF to MF switching action by pulling down the focus ring, which I really liked. It's also slightly lighter than the Sigma. Image quality was still very good, not quite as good as the Sigma, but still very, very usable. You'd be happy with the results it creates. I think the crowning glory for the Sony lens is its AF performance. It was pretty much flawless. It showed no signs of hunting during our testing and it was by far the best lens when it came to low light performance. So as you can see, it's a very, very tight call and there are clearly strong cases to be made for both of these lenses. However, for me personally, if I was really forced to pick one of these two lenses, I think I would have to go for the Sony. I just think I would personally rather have a lens that's able to provide consistently fast and accurate AF in all lighting conditions over it being marginally sharper in terms of image quality. I mean, let's face it, it doesn't matter how sharp a lens is, if the AF isn't reliable, then there's always that doubt in the back of your mind that it's not gonna quite lock on, you're gonna miss that shot. So for me, I'd rather have the reassurance that the AF is gonna work every time. I also feel that I would probably personally benefit from having optical stabilization for not only photography but for video work over the weather ceiling because for me if it's raining outside I probably just won't go out and shoot. That might not be the case for everyone and obviously if weather ceiling is an absolute must for you and you're not bothered by lens stabilization then the Sigma is definitely worth considering because by no means is it a bad lens. Just for me the Sony ticks more boxes albeit very marginally. Anyway, that's about it for now, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you've liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. Comment below, let me know if I've done a good job, if I've done a bad job, if there's anything else you'd like to see included in these big tests. We always value your feedback, it's really helpful. Just be nice, please, please be nice. <laughs> also, if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. We release new videos just like this every single Friday. Next week is gonna be a very interesting one, so you won't wanna miss out on that. I'll see you then.